Well, thank you to everyone who's, uh, who's coming in for joining us today uh, for uh, the latest meeting of the Ledge Branch Capacity Working Group. Um, I'm Jonathan Bidlack. I am the Interim Director of the Governance Department at R Street, uh, as well as the Director of the Fiscal and Budget Policy Project. And uh, we are very fortunate to have one of my uh, colleagues, who I'm sure many of you know, uh, James Walner, uh, who is perhaps one of the foremost experts on uh, Congress and, and the Senate. Uh, perhaps he would disagree. We'll find out. Um, for those of you who don't know James, I'll just give you a little bit of background. Um, he uh, is, a, as, as I mentioned, a senior fellow at the R Street Institute in the Governance Department. Um, he is a lecturer in the Department of Government at American University and a fellow at American University's uh, Center for Congressional and Presidential Studies. Uh, he has also a very substantial uh, experience working on the Hill. He was executive director of the Senate Steering Committee uh, under both the chairmanships of uh, Senators uh, Toomey and Mike Lee, uh, and was also an, uh, an LD in, in multiple offices. Uh, and he's also the author of two books, uh, and the one that is, I think, uh, very relevant to uh, uh, our current discussion, uh, The Death of Deliberation, Partisanship and Polarization in the United States Senate. And uh, today we are talking about the filibuster, which is, of course, I think everyone's favorite, um, I don't know, punching bag on both sides of the aisles. And I, I, and I guess it depends on, on you know, whichever side you are, you are in and uh, 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 as to whether or not at any particular time you find the, the filibuster to be uh, infuriating or um, uh, you know, an obstruction to, to the, the way that the Senate is supposed to operate. And I think um, James has some very interesting views on this topic. And, uh, you know, I am uh, basically going to uh, ask a few questions. But for those of you who would like to ask questions as well, um, feel free to post them in the chat box. Um, it would be, uh, sorry, in the, in the Q&A box rather than the chat box. Uh, and I will work to get to as many of those during the course of our conversation as possible, uh, in addition to uh, some of the um, some of the questions that I have myself. And uh, I know from James and I talking, uh, you know, there's a no question is sort of off, off base. Feel free to ask uh, your most controversial questions as well. And I think we'll, uh, we'll work to address those. But um, I guess uh, to that end, you know, talking about controversy, there were uh, remarks that were made recently by former President Obama, who um, basically said that the filibuster is the relic of the Jim Crow era. And, uh, and I think that there's obviously been an attempt and sort of a lot of talk about needing to get rid of the filibuster. Um, James, you wrote recently in a piece for Law and Liberty, you said, um, quote, Obama's critique of the filibuster is ironically at odds with how John Lewis understood politics. Um, and you sort of took issue with the characterization that uh, President Obama, um, uh, you know, how he, how he discussed the filibuster. And so I wonder if we could maybe start off there and, and you know, address, uh, the, you know, what you see as uh, this misconception and uh, maybe any other misconceptions that you think that are, that are sort of out there at the moment. Yes, wonderful. Um, thanks for hosting this, Jonathan, this uh, very timely, I think, discussion about the filibuster and to everybody else at R Street and to all of you all who are joining us virtually. Uh, these are strange times, but, you know, maybe there'll be normal times after a while if we keep doing this for, you know, however long we're going to do it. But, you know, when you say things like the filibuster is a relic of the Jim Crow era, which the former president, uh, Barack Obama, did, that strikes the vast majority of people as something entirely reasonable and sensible, uh, something sensible to say. And I think that flows from the fact that we have a, an understanding of the filibuster that does not quite comport with what the filibuster actually is. And you know, I think starting with the Jim Crow era and John Lewis, uh, the, the late congressman, uh, who is a, a terrific individual, a, a freedom fighter, a, a social activist, and a longtime member of Congress, a member of the House, uh, not the Senate. But he framed it very well, I think, in his op-ed. He, he didn't mean to. He wasn't referring to the filibuster per se. But at the end of his op-ed, the last thing he wrote, which was published in the New York Times uh, the day or the day after he, he passed away, you know, at the end, he closes by saying, you know, we need to you know, stand up and speak up and speak out. And this is certainly, I think, something that is thematic of the civil rights uh, movement more generally that he helped lead along with others like Dr. Martin Luther King. And what you see there is a commitment to civic activism, to, to participating in debate and civil disobedience, if need be, in the public square in an effort to persuade one's fellow countrymen and citizens of your, the righteousness and the correctness of your point of view. It is not about shutting down everything. It is not about uh, stopping 
the debate. It, if anything, it's about forcing that debate to happen. And if we think about the filibuster and what the filibuster actually is, it's not a veto, which is how we understand it today, and we can get into all the nitty gritty. But just as a broad based overview, the filibuster, all it is, is the opportunity for any senator, whether that's the former Senator Barack Obama or Jesse Helms or James Eastland, the, the segregationist chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee or Howard Metzenbaum or any other senator to participate in debate for as long as he or she is able. That is all it is. And it seems to me that if you don't have that rule there, or if you don't have that ability, then it becomes very hard for senators to stand up and speak up and speak out on behalf of their constituents, regardless of what their constituents may want or what he or she may want. And I think that's just a base understanding, misunderstanding that we have to correct here. Yeah, so I think um, maybe it's worth taking a bit of a step back. We have, uh, you know, someone uh, asked the question, just how does the filibuster work? And I think it's, you know, for framing this discussion, it might be helpful to kind of go through a little bit of that, um, that nitty gritty. And, and this questioner also asks, you know, why don't senators actually have to stand there and talk for days like they used to? So maybe it would be useful to, uh, to talk a little bit about, um, you know, the, the actual mechanics of the filibuster and a little bit, I think, about the history in terms of how has usage of the filibuster uh, changed over time in, in your understanding? It's a it's a great question, and what you see. So it's the, let's frame it with regard to the House, which everybody pretty much understands. The House, they know uh, where the House is. Um, you know how the House operates. It's our kind of quintessential legislative chamber. In the House, there's this thing called the previous question, which is you know for you know, all intents and purposes is simply a, a motion that the majority can approve to to force a vote on an issue, on an underlying issue, to basically end debate and vote right then. And it's something that the House has always had. The Senate had the, the same motion up until I think about 1806 or so, although they very rarely used it uh, in the early days. And even when they did, it wasn't necessarily to stop debate and force a vote on things. And remember, we had for most of this period, like 26, 28 senators. 30 senators represent, you know, in this small chamber. So it's very small and very clubby at that, at that time, even more so than today. And it was more of a way to put off questions if they didn't want to, to take them up. But regardless, from 1806 until 1917, there's no, there's no way to end, it, end debate. As long as senators are seeking recognition to speak or are speaking on the floor, those are the two criteria, there is no way for the Senate to force a vote, for the presiding officer to call a vote on an underlying piece of legislation. Well, in 1917, we have the, what we call the cloture rule today, Rule 22, and this is an important distinction. Most people think about cloture as something that helps the minority. Cloture was put in the rule book to empower the majority. Granted, it was a super majority at the time, two thirds present in voting. Today, it's three fifths uh, duly sworn and chosen. So typically 60 if all 100 senators have, uh, occupy their offices. But at the time, and that was, it was seen as something that would empower the majority to, to schedule votes over a committed uh, faction of the minority. Who, who wanted to filibuster a piece of legislation. And ironically, and this is what some, uh, some great academics, uh, um, Waro and Schickler wrote a great book called, um, you know, The Filibuster on Obstruction in the 19th Century Senate. And they call this, you know, one of the great ironies of, the, of Rule 22 was it turned obstruction from a costly activity into a costless activity. And what do I mean by that? So before we had the cloture rule on the books, there was no way, literally no way to end a debate under the rules. No, no way. The filibuster was supreme. It could not be stopped. And guess what happened during that period of time? The Senate functioned, the Republic didn't fall into the ocean. And they, I mean, we had a civil war, but that wasn't because of the filibuster. And but the Senate continued to do big things and small things and dumb things and great things and everything in between. And it did so with actually more uh, narrower majorities, simpler majorities. And so it's an odd thing today. It's like we can't name a, a post office because of the filibuster. Whereas back then they could do all sorts of things. And it was because the majority would just wait out the minority. They would force the majority to speak. They would engage in wars of attrition. And if the minority was really determined and the majority wasn't really determined, then they would drop it. Or if they were, the American people decided, well, this is a really big, important issue, then a debate would elevate the issue and help to educate senators along the way. 
And these are really intense debates. Over in the late 19th century, there's a debate over imperialism and whether or not we should annex Cuba. And if I think I have the history off uh, is correct here, but there were two senators from South Carolina. So we're not talking like, you know, you know, somebody from the heartland and somebody from the coast in today's nomenclature or left and right. You have literally two Democratic senators from South Carolina who get in a fist fight on the Senate floor over this treaty. Right. They still I mean, it's a treaty. It's not a filibuster. You know, it's it takes a higher vote to ratify it. But at the end of the day, the Senate did lots of big consequential stuff. And they did so with narrow minor, uh, majorities, except at the very end of a session where something would come up and the minority could literally just speak for two or three days and then it would be done. But that's, that's the fault of the majority for you don't wait until the last minute to do some big stuff. Um, and then after 1917, all of a sudden, you have the cloture rule. It doesn't work as it does today immediately, right? So the Senate continues to operate like they do. They don't really invoke cloture. They do it a couple of times right, right when they adopt this rule. And then it doesn't really happen until the late 50s, early 60s. And the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was one of only a handful of times where cloture was invoked successfully, I should say. Because senators just didn't think it was a, it didn't make sense. Like that was something they didn't like to do. Carl Hayden, a senator from Arizona, like was like, I will never vote for cloture. And the way they actually, uh, you know, did it back then, even in 1964, it was still a war of attrition type thing. Mike Mansfield put the Civil Rights Act of uh, 1964 on the Senate floor in March of a presidential election year. And it stayed there until June. And then it ultimately passed. And yes, they got cloture, but a big part of getting cloture was having that debate. But over time, what happened was that as the Senate's workload, I think the standard narrative goes, got more and more crowded, that all of a sudden you would ask, you would try to set aside the rules and ask unanimous consent to schedule votes to do other things. And senators would object to that. And that gave them a lot of power. It gave one senator power that, you know, one senator can't speak on the floor for all that long. But if you ask for their permission to have a vote, then all of a sudden they got a lot of power. And then if you couple that with the need to file cloture, if they object, then all of a sudden you have, you know, it turns into a, that is the filibuster. But in reality, it's just the majority saying, we would much rather use this convenient scheduling tool called cloture than we would do what the Senate has done since the beginning of time, which is actually legislate. Yeah, that's a great point. I think um, how much, I guess the, the natural follow-up is how much of what we've seen has been sort of the, um, the frog in the boiling water phenomenon where um, the interaction of senators with the filibuster process has changed slowly over time versus there being actual flashpoints. So, you know, my expertise is in the area of, of budget policy. And one of the things you find that this, the seminal budget law is the 1974 Budget Act, which sort of redefined the way in which we budget at the federal level. And that's a, that's a flashpoint in and of itself. Um, but there are many of us who make the argument that, you know, the, the difficulties that we've seen, for example, in, in, you know, passing a budget every year or passing appropriations bills on time can very often be traced back to the changes that were made in 1974. And so, but it took a while for, I think, legislators to figure out how they could game that process. And so, um, as I see it, you know, a lot of your argument is that uh, the filibuster has already always existed, or at least existed for a very long period of time. And we know that, you know, Congress or the Senate specifically was able to function properly uh, when we had the filibuster. Therefore, um, since we have the filibuster now, um, it seems reasonable to expect that um, we should be able to function even with the existence of, of the continued existence of the filibuster. I think the counter argument to that is that um, you know, it just takes a while for members to figure out how to game that system. And uh, maybe they, uh, you know, they, they may have been prodded along through things like an increased workload, for example, that forced them to, um, to you know, redefine how they use this particular tool in their, in their arsenal. Uh, but I wonder how you respond to that argument and, and how much of this you see as sort of um, just the natural evolution of the Senate um, and, and sort of people being uh, you know, members being more able to understand the tools at their disposal and how they might be able to use them in ways that they weren't used in the past? Um, or are there, are there certain flashpoints? You know, you mentioned the Civil Rights Act in 1964. Are there flashpoints like that that fundamentally change the nature of the way that people use these tools? Look, there's, there's no question that the Senate is an incredibly social institution. Ted Kennedy wrote a, has a, a member memoir, and generally member memoirs are awful books, but for some reason I read, and this is Republican and Democrat alike, this is not a, you know, a unique phenomenon on either side, 
But I read uh, his member memoir, it was called A True Compass, and he calls the Senate a, a chemical body, he, which is a phenomenal description. It's hands down the best description I've ever heard of the Senate. And he says, the Senate is a chemical body. He said, like, and something happens when everybody is stuck in a room and they realize they're not going home until they get something done. And what hap you have all of this interaction and reaction and everything else. And the problems you highlight in the appropriations process and the budget process, that I think illustrates why the filibuster is not the problem. It's when you couple the filibuster, or not even the filibuster, it's when you couple a, a determination to only use cloture to process the Senate's work and to manage the Senate's work with an unwillingness to allow for amendments and allow for debate. And those two things combined then all of a sudden grind the Senate to a halt because you can't really, the Senate exists to adjudicate the concerns of its members who are in turn representing the concerns of the, their constituents. And they disagree. Of course they disagree. We have a big, beautiful, diverse country here and they are going to disagree. James Madison tells us in Federalist 10 that disagreement is vital to the security of our freedoms and liberties. So we need that disagreement. But we have a Senate and it, the way it's being managed today where that disagreement's being seen as a bad thing. And I mentioned this in the law and liberty piece. And the reason why is because the whole understanding of, of lawmaking has shifted. So it's, Obama can say the filibuster is illegitimate because it stands in the way of building his legislative widget, whatever that may be. Republicans can say the same thing. The same talking points flip back and forth depending on who's in control of the factory at that time. But that's not what the Senate's for. They don't build widgets. They don't build widgets according to a blueprint that's been assembled somewhere up that, or assemble widgets according to a blueprint that's been designed by someone else. They are literally designing in the blueprint and they're building it. And the way they do that on the basis of equality is by debating and voting and arguing and fighting, hopefully not throwing punches at each other. But the Senate's history says that even then it still works. As long as there is a commitment that on that chamber floor, ultimately, is where the most consequential decisions are going to be made. And, you know, I mentioned, you mentioned the Civil Rights Act of 64. I alluded to Mike Mansfield. You know, Mitch McConnell and Chuck Schumer and Harry Reid won't, won't put a non-binding budget resolution that no one knows how to read, that makes no sense to anybody, that no one can decipher. They won't put it on the floor like 13 years before a presidential election, much less the Civil Rights Act of 64, an issue that is uh, hugely significant that divides their parties. I mean, Mansfield was convinced it was going to destroy his party. The leaders today won't do that. And that, I think that shows an insight into how they view managing the Senate. It's a way to keep things under wraps. And if we look at 1964 and we look at the 60s and what came after 1964, it was a very tough time in American history. And there was a lot of conflict and a lot of disorder. And there was, everybody was upset. On the left, the right, conservatives, progressives, everybody was taking to the streets. People were engaged in civic activism throughout in, into the early 70s. And it was one of the, the, the workload started to rise. Filibusters started to rise. Obstruction started to rise. All kinds of stuff started happening. And it was one of the most productive periods in this nation's history in terms of legislation. I may not like ever, all of the legislation it produced, but that's, the constitution wasn't written to make James Walner happy. And so, all you don't know it wasn't written to make anybody happy it was written to ensure that we have a place where we can go and fight and hopefully try to prevail over what we think our policies ought to be and it's the unwillingness to have that and tolerate that i think that really speaks to the dysfunction in our in our in our political system and in the senate in particular and so far as i can tell i don't who's filibustering in the senate literally no one's filibustering the problem isn't the rules the problem is an unwillingness to use the rules to legislate and instead to ask unanimous consent. That's, and then when you can't, when somebody objects, then you say, well, I'm filing cloture. Well, the debate has only been going on for like four hours. And we're gonna immediately file cloture and nobody gets any amendments. This is a take it or leave it proposition. You can't change anything about it. Well, of course that's not gonna work. I mean, that's just the way it works. I mean, that's just, it's nonsense to think that you can legislate on significant controversial issues in a sustained manner in that way. Yeah, I think that's right. I think I think there's definitely um, it's it's not necessarily so much the the filibusters usage, but the threat of the filibusters usage that that scares people. And I think 
it, um, it scares people in, in, in two different contexts. I mean, one is what we've been talking about, which is, you know, the sort of scuttling of, of the legislative agenda. Um, but the other component that I think we, we should talk about is, is you know, nominations, um, which is something that, that comes up all the time and I think is perhaps even more so the motivation for, um, for some to want to see the filibuster go away. Um, David asked a question along these lines that I'll, I'll read in full because I, I think it's a good one. Um, he says, each state, whatever its population is, two senators. As a result, senators representing 18% and elected by just over 9% of the American electorate, a majority of that 18%, can control the Senate and confirm federal judges. Might it encourage the appointment of consensus judicial candidates, appointments based on competence rather than ideology, where judicial candidates to require confirmation by more than a bare majority of the U.S. Senate, and for generations didn't the filibuster in effect do that? And so, um, you know, I think there's a there's a um, we can obviously talk about this issue in the context of of the legislative agenda and sort of willingness to debate and changing perceptions of what that debate should be on the House floor, uh, sorry, on the Senate floor. But then there's also this this broader question uh, about about um, not just the legislative agenda, but also with respect to, uh, to nominations. And so I think it may be worth you uh, answering that question. Yeah, and I think the dysfunction we see and have seen in the nominations process is a extension of the dysfunction we see on the legislative side of things and an unwillingness to adjudicate concerns on legislation prompts senators to look around and try to achieve their goals uh, in other ways via you know using leverage inside the chamber by objecting to different nominees or actually trying to bargain with the white house and holding nominees in that regard and this is something that has been going on since the literally the very first senate and this is something that you know the senate has always done senators have a right to use the rules to to stop people and not stop people it's up to them but they have to be committed to to doing that you know i think we have this, again, with this kind of factory mindset that we have about politics today, there's this assumption and it is common on both sides that the Senate exists to approve the president's people and the president needs people either in the executive branch or to confirm judges. And there's this sense that somehow these judges, we can't have any politics intervene and nothing else can happen. And I think both of those are nonsense. I mean, the Senate is a separate uh, and equal branch uh, or part of the legislature, which is a separate branch of the federal government that is literally the whole role is designed to ensure that the president doesn't have a, you know, a blank check in staffing the administration. That's the whole point. They debated this in 1787 in Philadelphia. And that's the point, number one. So the idea that somehow the Senate is obligated to approve who the, Senate, the president supports, no. And as far as the federal the judiciary goes, it seems to me that these are lifetime appointments that are increasingly consequential because both parties are pushing more and more issues to the courts to be decided by their inability and refusal to legislate. And so, you know, we saw this with Kavanaugh and I don't like, you know, I don't like to see a lot of this, the stuff that we've seen surrounding the uh, confirmation process in recent years. But, you know, at the end of the day, what do we expect? If people get the sense that the Supreme Court is ruling them and the only chance they have are to weigh in on that process are two. One, when they vote for the president and two, surrounding any confirmation process. Well, then of course it's gonna be turned up to 13 or whatever the notches and spinal tap. I mean, if that's gonna be, it's gonna be like twice that eventually because it's, it, it all flows out of this inability of the Senate to legislate. The, the Senate has long had, um, they long have been bargaining with the president behind the scenes on judges and, and executive branch nominees. There have been fights in the past. There is no one right way to, to do things. But today, what's really interesting is that it's, we suggest that it's in, inappropriate or illegitimate for them to, to do so. And look, if they're two senators that, from like Wyoming, it's not hard for the rest of the Senate to roll those two senators. It's not. I mean, they're just two senators. And the second you work for a senator or you are a senator and you put yourself in their shoes or you are in those shoes and you want to try to stop something, you realize how hard it is to stop something when everybody else doesn't want it to stop. And you have to work really, really hard. And it's not like they come and ask your permission and you say no. And then they say, oh, I guess we're done here. That's not how it works. And so I think we, you know, we have this whole understanding of the filibuster that does not match one, what is happening in reality, and two, how the rules actually exist and work on paper and have in the past. And I think the reason why is because it benefits both parties and it benefits both sides very well. It's easy. 
Yeah, you uh, you touch on this in your in your piece. You say uh, you know you you note that a senator cannot prevent them from voting in perpetuity, strictly speaking, because they cannot speak indefinitely. And so, in that sense, um, you know, the filibuster may be a tool to slow things down, but not ultimately to stop. Uh, I think you know one one potential critique of that would be that. Um, that might be true on a, a particular issue. So let's say, you know, um, Cong uh, you know, the Senate is debating the next transportation bill or what it might be, and there's the ability to use the filibuster just to have a debate over that legislation, but that ultimately there needs to be a vote on that legislation. I think the, the argument that uh, those who, who sort of put um, a lot of, of blame on the filibuster for Senate dysfunction would say is that um, it's true that any one item, one legislative item, whether it's a nomination or a uh, um, or you know a specific legislative um, uh, agenda item, can get through. But when you have the potential to do this over and over over time, um, you potentially create the ability to slow down uh, the the what goes on in the Senate. And so, um, you know, the problem here is not with respect to any one particular presidential appointment, but um, now the ability of the minority party to slow down hundreds of presidential appointments. And so it's, while it's true that um, you know, it requires a lot of effort, uh, if that's the only tool that is theoretically at the minority's disposal, uh, it seems reasonable that they might use that tool to the greatest extent possible. Um, we got a question from, from Mark who says, uh, political theorist Wilmore Kendall said Congress has, quote, all the ultimate weapons in any, sh in any showdown with either of the other two branches. Do you think it would be accurate to view the filibuster as the Senate minority's ultimate weapon to ensure that they are heard? And, and it might be worth to kind of answer that question, I think, with some of the historical context as well. Wilmore Kendall, wow, that's a lot of it. Um, you know, what, look, I would just say that with regard to any, you know, the big backlog of stuff, Right now, the Senate's not doing anything, literally nothing. It's like crickets there. And so for that, it seems that, you know, certainly not the problem now. It is certainly not the problem now. But you quickly find out how hard it is even to do a whole, I mean, 41 senators, it's hard to get 41 senators together to, to block cloture on anything on a sustained period of time. And the minority in response to that can make tweaks to the bill. They can try to buy off individual senators. They can have a process. It is so hard to stop something when they give you what you want and you still lose. It is like, it, it is really hard. And, but we think, we don't think of it in those terms. We don't think of it as an adverbial type thing. We don't think of it as a process that plays out over time. It's just static. And it's like, okay, let's look at the paper. Okay, there's 41 senators here and they have an R after their name and there's you know, you know, 60 over here, 59, and they've got a D after their name and R's like this and D's like that. So what's the point? I mean, that, but that's like no legislation ever passes like that of any consequence. It never has. It takes time and everybody disagrees. There are very few things the parties are in agreement on. And as far as the the question about the filibuster being something that you know, helps the Senate and minorities. I, I think of the filibuster as something that helps individual senators. You know, if the minority wants to do something, they have lots of tools at their disposal as long as all of their individual senators are willing to act. But right now, what the filibuster is, it's something that empowers individual senators to have their say or to have a little bit of leverage potentially to force the majority to negotiate with it, although that very rarely happens now. And we have this sense that somehow if we only empower the majority, everything is gonna be great. But that's not the way our system was set up. Our system was set up to stop, you know, we don't wanna empower anybody. We don't want majorities to rule us and we don't want minorities to rule us. We wanna create a space, you know, from a political theory standpoint, where individual people and their representatives can get together and argue and hash things out. And it is remarkable how the process always leads to outcomes. Always. The, the kicker is you can't control what those outcomes are in advance. But nine times out of 10, a bill's gonna pass. I can only think on a handful of occasions where bills haven't passed in the Senate after a process played out. And when I was in the Senate, I worked for senators and part of my job was to stop things they didn't like from happening. Well, the, the number one thing I would always try to do is stop the process from happening in any way, shape or form. Because then when you stop the process, well, it's common sense. If you don't want something to pass, stop the process that the Senate uses to pass things. Today, our leaders stop the process before it even gets started. And then they scratch their heads and they wonder why they can't pass anything. 
It's ridiculous. And so I think, you know, and I would just say as, as far as these, you know, individual narrow issues, nothing, very few things are zero sum in American politics. And it's remarkable how clarifying votes can be. There's an art, argument right now, an article about a dispute over state and local aid and how much it should be. Is it like 400 billion? Is it 900 billion? Well, you know, put it on the floor. Senators can offer amendments. Maybe somebody offers 485. Maybe somebody offers, you know, 3 trillion. Maybe somebody offers something in between. And guess what? One of those is going to pass. And if nothing passes, then that means that the, there's no support for any of it and there's no agreement, but that debate itself elevates the, 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 the issue, informs the people, the media will cover it because they love this kind of stuff. And then we can go forward with a better understanding about where everybody stands on this issue. Yeah, I think you've, I think you've made that point and uh, I've heard you make that a couple times and I think it's a very good one that, you know, the conception of what the purpose of uh, the Senate floor is about has changed. It's no longer, um, you know, to be deliberative, but to basically bring a finished product to the floor. And I wonder, I, I wonder maybe you could talk a little bit about, I mean, fr from my perspective, um, you know, this may just be correlation, but it's sort of happened that that perception to me seems to have changed at the same time that um, leadership has gotten stronger than it perhaps was in the past. And so, you know, from the standpoint of, of uh, Senate leadership, um, you know, it's to their advantage to bring a finished product that they hash out, you know, uh, you know behind closed doors or for those proverbial closed doors, um, and then have the vote happen as quickly as possible and they get their agenda in, in the way that they're happy with. And so I wonder to what degree you think that you know, some of the problems that we may be blaming on the filibuster or about, you know, rules, generally speaking, in the Senate really are reflecting this broader trend that's been going on that's been exacerbated by both parties, um, which is that, you know, more and more power has sort of been centralized or invested in, uh, in party leaders. And so uh, what we're seeing, the dysfunction that we're ultimately seeing is really more representative of this, this, you know, incongruousness between individual members uh, who, you know, may not be in sort of the party leadership um, and those who are, who are, you know, running the show, so to speak. Are, are we, are we, you know, confusing those two, those two ideas? Are we blaming the filibuster for, for this other, this other ongoing trend? Yeah, I think uh, that's a, an astute observation because the way that the leaders manage the Senate today makes it dysfunctional and they blame the filibuster but it's not about necessarily empowering the leaders i mean you know the troublemakers on the left and the right of the of the 60s and 70s would just laugh at the, the leaders today they would laugh at them because they don't have any more power than the leaders did back then the senators have all the ability and all the options and all the leverage they used to have if not more because of the televised floor proceedings and the media and everything else and so there's a lot of resources at individual senators disposal but it's just that they're unwilling to use them and i think that really s says it's not just the leaders it's the senate itself there's a, a new kind of culture and awareness in the institution whereby it is it's not even like workhorses versus show horses which was uh, donald matthew's famous description of you know workhorses were like the good guys who would like work in committee and like do good things and show horses where people are always gallivanting around in the media. Well, yeah, I get that. And people today still say messaging is a bad thing. Well, if you messaging is just a legislating from a position of weakness, like if no one in the committee agrees with you, what are you going to do? You know, go wait for, you know, 3000 years until maybe one day they do No, the Civil Rights Act of 64 never would have passed if that was the strategy. You go outside of the Senate, you go outside of the committee to try to bring pressure to bear in a dy dynamic process, you force the issues, you take action. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Most of the time you lose. And the problem though, is that that is a very, uh, it's, a, it's a very uncertain endeavor. Uh, you can't control it. You don't know what's gonna happen. You can't be certain what you're gonna be confronted with at any given moment. And all senators have to really hustle. And today, senators don't want to do that because it takes, it's a lot of work. It's very unsettling. And if you're a leader, it, the world has got to be very scary from their perspective because they're looking out, everybody thinks they have all the answers and they can't even control the institution. You know, and they've got it all jerry-rigged with all these different rules and precedents and everything else. But in reality, it's not, the, the Senate is not, a, is, is not equipped to be managed from a top-down fashion like they are today. It just isn't going to work. And I think we're seeing that. Uh, but until, so we have all this angst, 
but nobody's willing to work on it and nobody's willing to try to, to achieve their goals and win, if you will, in a very crude fashion inside the Senate. And until that changes, then we're going to continue to have all this angst. And we can blame the filibuster all we want. But so far as I can tell, you know, all these polarized minorities, all these really intensely partisan minorities, why aren't they filibustering? Why aren't these polarized majorities using other rules in the, in the rule book, like rule 19 and other things that they can use to, to cut down on filibusters? I went to a meeting once and they were like, well, we need a talking filibuster. We, that's what we need. We need a talking filibuster, force people to hold the floor. I'm like, what do you think the filibuster is? <laughs> like you can't filibuster if you're not on the floor talking. That's like, it's just common, like you can't do it, right? And so, but we already have one, but we don't even see that. Rule 19, you can only give two speeches in any given one in one legislative day. And legislative day can last from here to eternity because it's the Senate, I guess, till the end of a Congress. So a two year period, a one day up to two years. Um, but, you know, and they, the people like Bobby Byrd would use this, this kind of stuff all the time when he was majority leader to try to force issues. And to force things, if there was a minority, if it, you know, the people I used to work for, if you had like Mike Lee or Rand Paul or Ted Cruz trying to cause trouble, then it would be, he would deal with it super easy and just very, very quickly. Um, but they don't do that today because they're, un, it's so uncertain and they don't want to reveal the, the divisions within their parties. And so they don't want to have votes. They don't want to have things lay out there for a long time. And so it's like, we have to control everything. And once we get it designed perfectly, then we have to push it through. And if whatever stands in our way, it's, it, you know, it's racist, it's bad, it's illegitimate. You know, look, I mean, people, I mean, racists can use this stuff just as much as non-racists can use this stuff, but it's the American people who get to make that determination. And I think in today's day and age, if we had a bunch of, you know, Ku Klux Klansmen on the floor of the Senate, and incidentally, Bird was in the Klan, I will say, um, but if we had, you know, on the floor of the Senate, my guess is they wouldn't win. I don't know in what world that would happen. I, I think that a uh, court of public opinion would be overwhelming. I don't think many senators would like to be associated with them. And so the antidote to this dysfunction is more sunshine, more debate, more arguments, and more votes and forcing senators to actually work. It's, it's weird. If you want to legislate, you have to legislate. Yeah. When I hear someone talk about a, a talking filibuster, I immediately think that, uh, you know, they might need to brush up on their, their Jimmy Stewart catalog a little bit, perhaps, because uh, uh, you're right. That is, that is obviously how it's supposed to operate. Um, I, I think another, another question that, that someone brings up that I think is a, a very interesting one is uh, talking about the relationship between the legislature and the presidency. And, you know, over time, it, it's no secret that, uh, you know, for better or worse, the executive has, has, you know, taken control or taken purview of more decisions uh, and, and just more uh, responsibility uh, in, in the overall lawmaking process, uh, which is perhaps, uh, you know, not, uh, not what we might want to see. But I, uh, it's, a, it's a question of whether or not, um, to the degree that there's increasing dysfunction in, in, the, uh, in the legislature and in the Senate specifically, how much of the push to uh, eliminate the filibuster is being driven by um, what's seen as the legislature just not being as efficient as the, as the executive. So the, the question that John asks, uh, he says, one argument for abolishing the filibuster might be that the legislature has a much more difficult time creating law than does the administrative agencies, which can churn out regulation about as quickly as the APA will allow. In other words, the people's representatives in Congress have a much more difficult time legislating than do faceless bureaucrats who are not held accountable to the people. Arguably, the filibuster contributes to the, to the dysfunction of the legislature and the administrative agencies act to fill that void. What would be your response to this argument? I think the first thing is the Senate's not a factory. It's not, I mean, it's a job. This is going to sound weird. The Senate's job is not to churn out laws. It's not to turn, it's not to pass X number, it doesn't have efficiency targets. It's not a production process. It's a legislative process. They're fundamentally different things. In the Senate, you, you, the, you apply, you, know, you try to achieve your goals by persuasion and bargaining and negotiation. It's not about application of expertise. I mean, hopefully we have experts who are informing these debates. Hopefully we have staffers. And, and outside organizations who are informing these debates and senators who are letting that uh, expertise inform these debates. But ultimately, it's a process. You go to the Senate to participate in a process. The outcomes are dessert. They're icing on the cake. Self-government is about a process. It's adverbial. 
And the idea that somehow, well, we can't, and you saw this with the president's executive orders with regard to, or one executive order and memorandum regarding the, uh, um, the COVID-19 uh, stuff on unemployment and uh, the payroll tax holiday and other things. It's like, well, Congress can't pass this law, so it's an emergency. I'm going to do it anyway. Well, that's that. Uh, and President Obama had a similar mentality with regard to DACA. But that assumes that the end is not participating in this process. The end is this policy we're supposed to do. But the second you adopt that view, they throw the Constitution out the window, throw the entire institutional structure of our government out the window because it's not compatible. When you have a means ends view of politics, you immediately rationalize departures from the rules, extra legal, extra constitutional stuff all the time. You start doing it whenever you need to, to achieve your end. And both sides do it. That's why they seem so hypocritical. But in reality, they're like, of course, I, you know, the Democrats can't get rid of the filibuster, but we can because we have good ends and their ends are bad. Well, you know, so, but then when it flips around, they're not being hypocritical. They have a different view of politics. They think about it as a, a factory, as a production process, and that Congress is, it doesn't have a place in that kind of process. I agree. It's a, if you were going to build a Ford, you know, you wouldn't do it on the floor of the Senate. That's the, that's the dumbest idea ever. It would, like, what, no, you wouldn't do it. It would, it would look terrible and nobody would buy it. But that's not, the Senate doesn't build Fords. They, you know, they, they adjudicate disputes and ultimately make collective decisions, collective decisions. And then those decisions ultimately govern the kind of structure under which our administrative agencies and other things operate. And, but we've seemed to have forgotten that. And so our mentality, I often ask people, is there even a place for Congress and for the Senate in our current way we think and understand politics today? And I think the question is no. And I think this um, you know, decision about, or this you know, kind of mysticism and, and confusion about the filibuster, I think speaks to that. The fact that we don't even see that it's not, the, the rules aren't the problem. It's when you choose not to follow the rules and you ask unanimous consent and then somebody says, well, I object. Right. And then or you say yeah, we're going to end debate and you have a, a closure vote on like the third day of debate, even though you filed closure on the very first day. And there's been zero amendments and no debate whatsoever. And then we're like scratching our heads going, well, why would they do that? Like we all know that the, the goal here is to pass this bill. It's not to debate it. It's not to amend it. It's already been done. Those things have been decided and they need to assume their positions on the Senate floor and get to work assembling the widget. And the last thing I'll say is Mansfield had a great, great comment about this when he gave a fabulous speech or he put it in the record. Uh, he was going to give it. He went down to the floor to give it and he, he announced that President Kennedy was assassinated. And so he waited till the following week. He put it in the record. And then there's a speaker uh, leader series, uh, speaker series where all of the former leaders came to the old Senate chamber. You can uh, get it on the Senate website and C-SPAN. It's fabulous. And Mansfield finally delivers the speech. And he says, look, the Senate, these guys and girls, they're not, they're, they don't get their time card and clock in on and then go assume their position on the floor, right? That's not what they're doing. They're, this Senate is their Senate. And everything it does has to represent the collective outcome and enterprise of their efforts. And we have lost that view today. And that's why it's so broken. And, and I'm curious why you think we've lost that view or what, what may have um, brought about this change in sort of people's thinking and understanding and, and conception of the Senate. I mean, has that view always been there, I guess, or to what degree has it been there? And, and you know, to what degree, I mean, what really got us, in your view, to the point that we're at now? I mean, someone asked the question, uh, you know, how did these Senate leadership positions come to have, have the amount of power and influence they have today? What changed from the time the Senate floor was more deliberative? And I guess, you know, my follow-up question to that is, um, you know, is it a, is it, was, it a, was it a conscious change? Um, or was it something that, you know, the seeds were sort of always there that kind of, uh, you know, it percolated over time and that became something that, that now is, is the, the mainstream, view, you know, the mainstream widget view, as you call it, as to, as to how the Senate should operate. What do, you, what do you really see as motivating that change in people's thinking and understanding of the body as a whole? I mean, the Senate has always operated in different ways at different points in its time. And, and senators have always complained about the way the Senate is managed in the way it operates. So I, I, I do want to you know, clarify that point. But I, I do think this is something fundamentally different than what we've seen in the past. And I think it really, if you look at, say, 2008 to 2016 or so, this period of time, it's really remarkable because it, 
you see liberal progressive Democrats coming into the Senate and you see more and more conservative Republicans coming into the Senate. And you have all this outside angst and agitation either to, to do big things with President Obama or to stop these things from happening. And so both sides are starting to force their issues. And you have this big fight within both parties, the Democrats and the Republicans. I think the Republicans, it's a little bit easier to see because it played out uh, more or less uh, in the papers um, than the Democratic fight, but the Democrats had a fight too. And basically what that fight was over, is it okay to act to achieve your goals? Let's make it very simple. Is it okay to act? Is acting good or bad? And the outcome, you know, and I was then lived through most of this was that it's bad. This is something very similar. It's not just the con it's Senate. It's like, think about AOC coming into the house you know, and she's like coming in, like just ready to go and green new deal and all this stuff. And, and Pelosi and her whole party's like, whoa, 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 slow down, slow down. We get it. We agree with you. But if you want to do this, don't act. That's basically what they said. And it, it's like nonsense to anybody not in, in socialized into that world. That is like literally nonsense. And so you had these newer members coming in and they were trying to force action on issues like immigration, on climate change, on all, a whole, whole host of other issues. And you have these big fights playing out within the parties, their caucus lunches and in member meetings in the Senate. And ultimately the, the, Basically, the, the outcome is that no senator, every senator now, as so far as I can tell, thinks that acting is like a really bad thing. It could be very destabilizing. And the reason why acting is so bad from a leader perspective is because if you look at immigration, it divides the parties. They don't want to force, they don't want to have this debate play out. It divides both parties. And so if you think, go back to the, when, like the first, uh, not the, like the first shutdown after 2013, it was like over a weekend. They wanted to pass the bill and have a vote. I think Rand Paul objected to voting on it right away or Democrats objected to something. And all of a sudden there were these negotiations and out of it, the Democrats said, we're not gonna do anything unless you codify DACA. And so they negotiate over the weekend. And then on Monday they come out and they like, we've got a deal, this is great. And Schumer and McConnell are announcing this deal. We've got a deal and here it is. We're not gonna codify DACA, but or we're not gonna like withhold any efforts to like deport people, I forget the exact language, but this is what we're gonna do. Right after this, we're gonna have a debate on that bill. And we're gonna put it on the floor right after this. And the progressives were furious because they were like, I don't trust you. Like how, and Schumer's like, this is the best we could do. Maybe it was the best he could do, but no one could see it because that negotiation played out behind closed doors. It wasn't like they could reconcile themselves to suboptimal uh, outcomes in like as the process unfolded. Like that's the whole point of the process, but they couldn't see that. They just had to take Schumer's word for it. Nobody trusts the, the leadership anymore because look at what's happened under both parties. It's just the same kind of status quo keeps continuing and people on the right and the left are very upset. But what's really informative here about, and this I think speaks to the filibuster and how it's not the problem. Right after that, they, the bill is indeed put on the floor and McConnell, Schumer and Durbin all cooperate to effectively fill the amendment tree to block people like Ted Cruz or Bernie Sanders from offering amendments. And then they like file cloture and they don't get cloture. And it's like, well, what are we gonna do? It's the filibuster, we can't do anything. And it's like, well, let Bernie offer his amendment. Let Ted offer his amendment. If they pass, they pass. If they don't, they don't. That's on them to fight as hard as they can to try to persuade their fellow senators uh, on whether or not they think it should pass or not. And then my guess is some sort of bill ultimately does pass in the end. But right now they say, well, we're just gonna have this staged process where nobody really gets to participate. We're giving them no reason whatsoever to vote for cloture. And in the end, we're just gonna blame the filibuster. And the reason they're doing it is because the parties are divided on immigration. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's right. I think um, another sort of follow-up question along these lines is, you know, we've, we've touched on a little bit, you know, the role of partisanship or, or perhaps uh, not role of partisanship, lack of a role for partisanship in, in this question. I mean, we've, we've seen the sort of uh, where, where people fall on the, on their opinion of the filibuster largely depends on the, the makeup of, of, you know, the partisan makeup maybe at the time. So maybe it's worth expounding a little bit on, on what role, if any, you think partisanship might play in this. And I think the other, the other question along these lines is, 
um, to what degree some of the other frameworks that I think people think about political issues are relevant here. I mean, you know, I think it would be it would be easy to to frame what you're talking about as sort of this, um, you know, establishment versus outsider kind of phenomenon. I mean, I think about you know, you, you mentioned AOC. I think about when when Ted Cruz, you know, was was in office in the, in, in the Senate for only a couple of years and made a big push to attempt to defund Obamacare, and he sort of uh, earned the ire of many people for that for that push, and, and Senator Lee to a degree as well. And so, um, I, I wonder to what what degree you think some of these traditional frameworks or these lenses that whereby we um, we interpret political outcomes are relevant in, in our understanding of the filibuster? Um, or is the topic of rules sort of something happening on its own out in a, uh, you know, in a, in a, in a different universe where, where these, these more traditional frameworks don't really apply? Yeah, I think the, I think the rules are their scapegoat. And I think that they are the way we understand politics operate. And we think about polarization. We think about partisan competition. And we say, well, there's no way that this world can, that this can work with those in the, that kind of environment, with this filibuster, with the rules that empower a minority of 41 senators or even a single senator to do all sorts of things. And then we stop there and we don't actually scratch the surface and say, well, what, what is it actually the rule? Are they using the rules? Are they trying to not use the rules? Like what's going on here? And what you find, I think is, I mean, just take a step back and that, you know, a little common sense, Polarization induces people to act. If you are a, you know, a rabble rouser, true believer, conservative or progressive, then you, you're going to wake up every morning and you're going to want to remake the world. And you're going to do everything in your power to do so, right? I mean, that's ostensibly the whole point. Otherwise, why? It's not a problem. If you are, if partisan competition is, is like, if you are such a hardcore partisan that all you care about, all you care about is making the other party look bad, well, then ostensibly, you're going to take steps to make the other party look bad, right? I mean, that's like, literally, that's otherwise, these things aren't problems. Polarization is not a problem if senators aren't acting. Partisan competition is not a problem if senators aren't acting. Not only that, it's illogical to suggest that, that they're not acting because of polarization. Because polarization ostensibly would mean they would be acting, right? They would be trying to do things. That's why they're polarized. They want to do things. They're not just going to sit there and say, I threatened to do this and maybe yawn a little bit and go to lunch with everybody and just like slap each other on the back. No, they're going to do like everything they can to try to do that. This is like what the civil rights uh, senators did after the election of 58 and into the 60s because their constituents were forcing them to take action. And this is the curious development here. Like, I mean, there's no... You know, action is neither good nor bad. It can be smart or dumb. I mean, depending on the, the situation, and that's for everybody to, to determine on their own. But ultimately, you have to try to take steps to, to do this stuff. And the way that, to pass bills, to adjudicate concerns, and to blame the rules when those steps aren't even being taken, it seems to me, is, is at, it, it, that shows us the real problem. And the real problem is that we... We don't want to take those steps. We don't want to do any of that stuff. We think that if you win in November and you have 51 senators, then you should be able to go in and then like turn the key and get that production line going and out comes all those widgets. But the kicker is those 51 senators agree on very little. I don't think that Democrats could pass an immigration bill right now, which is Democratic votes and the same with Republicans. They disagree on the most intense issues that concern the American people right now. It's actually, it's pretty ironic. If you think about all the issues that the American people care about right now, Congress is missing in action, and certainly the Senate. And whenever they do vote, it's usually after the, some like structured rig process where it, they just kind of jam everybody at the last second and they give people the ability to speak out of both sides of their mouth and everybody looks like they're happy and everybody looks like they're unhappy. And it's this weird Orwellian world where it's like everybody is unhappy with the status quo. And ostensibly, we're told by academics, by the media, by members themselves, that it's because we have all this polarization and partisanship, but yet no one's taking steps inside the Senate that would be consistent with what those uh, phenomenon would suggest they would be doing. And I think that, that and it's because of this production-oriented mindset. No, I think it's I think it's a great point. I think that um, you know a lot of commentators on on politics, generally speaking. Uh, treat the two parties increasingly as as a, as monoliths. You know that there's the, this assumption that 
um, you know, all of the Democrats in the House are united and all of the Republicans in the Senate are united. And the reality is there are huge uh, differences between, uh, you know, AOC and Nancy Pelosi or Mitch McConnell and, and Ted Cruz. And, um, and, and there may be many issues where there is alignment across, across uh, parties. And so um, to the degree that um, you want to get something done, uh, it's very rare, actually, that you, uh, that you don't have some level of agreement. I mean, you know, I, uh, spendingtracker.org, which I run, you see this all the time. If you look at the differences between what, you know, the average Democrat is voting for and the average Republican is voting for, it actually looks very similar uh, for those bills that are being passed into law. And it makes sense because most bills to, to ultimately be signed by the president, there has to be some level of agreement uh, across across the partisan divide. And even if it's true that we're more polarized than we've ever been before, what it actually takes to enact legislation, I think, largely hasn't changed or is, is very similar to uh, to how it's how it's always been. Um, we have a few minutes left and we've talked a lot about sort of the, I think the history of the filibuster and, and the current status of the filibuster, but maybe we can, uh, we can close by just talking a little bit about, about the future and, and what we might see, um, you know, in post November or post, post January and what you see as the future of the filibuster, setting aside sort of the normative questions, you know, what's, uh, what's, your, what's your perspective on what's likely to happen and maybe you can, um, you can tailor those remarks a little bit depending on you know, whether or not Donald Trump earns re-election or, or you know, Vice President Biden becomes president uh, or whether or not the Senate flips and the degree to which these sort of these, these upcoming variables, I guess, um, might change the future prospects for the filibuster. Well, I think that, uh, well, one, I really enjoyed this conversation. I could sit around and talk about the Senate and the filibuster and its history for you know, another three or four days if you if you want to um but you know i think it's really interesting because the senate so far as i can tell is going to look just like it does now regardless of of what happens because i think both sides see things exactly the same way and they're gonna they'll blame the filibuster when they can't get unanimous consent for stuff when they can't get the other side to agree to you know let's schedule these votes and let's move on um and so i think that's uh that's the first thing. And at the end of the day, it, we've already, you know, you said leave the normative kind of rule stuff behind, but there is no legislative or judicial filibuster. Like it's just rule 22 is cloture. And the majority can under the constitution use its power to change the rules whenever it wants admittedly. But again, if you do that and you have this means oriented view, those rules can lose their normative force very, very quickly. And ultimately what you see happening is that, you know, it's not that the legislative filibuster somehow has like this binding normative power that senators like. I mean, they've already gotten rid of the filibuster for all intents and purposes. They just limited its scope to, uh, you know, the nuclear option scope to, to judges. But every time they, they ignore the rules, they undermine the power of those rules over time. And so, I think the only thing right now, and this is a bit of a kind of counterintuitive view, the only thing that's saving the filibuster, the only thing that's, that's keeping this thing around is that the leaders themselves don't want to get rid of it because it's the only thing that allows them to schedule votes in the Senate. It's the only thing that allows them to argue uh, that their colleagues shouldn't make all these crazy procedural motions and appeal the rulings of the chair and, and do everything else when they fill the amendment tree. They use the filibuster as this kind of like the threat of get, you know, they threaten the filibuster. They say, well, if we do this, then the other party is going to get rid of the filibuster and that would be really bad. And that's how they keep their, you know, especially on the right, the, the outliers in control or on the left, how they keep the moderates un under control. And I think that ultimately, the, you know, the Senate right now, it can't work under a very managed partisan environment without the filibuster is a, is a, is a, is a whipping boy. Because if you can't blame the filibuster for all of these, your inaction on all of these things, like you know, from repealing the Affordable Care Act to everything in between, and the same for the Democrats, then what are you going to blame? And then eventually what will happen is your constituents will say, well, we want you to act. Like, why aren't you acting? And it'll be easier for them to see that you're not acting because there's no real way to blame them to blame anybody else. And then when you see that happen, all of a sudden you'll see the, the cracks come up within the parties and you'll see that they're actually a lot more divided than they are. And then that, the, the irony of the whole thing is that it'll show us that the filibuster was never the problem. 
was never the problem. The Senate, to, to suggest the filibuster again is the problem. I know I've been saying this over and over again, is to suggest that the Senate can operate without it. And I don't think that's true. And not only do I think from a normative standpoint, it would be not good for it to operate without it. I don't think it's true that it could operate without it from an empirical standpoint. Yeah, I think you, uh, I think you make a compelling case and we'll have to, uh, we'll have to end it there. But uh, um, thank you very much, James, for a conversation that I think was very illuminating and uh, um, really enjoyed it on my end. And uh, thank you to everyone for attending uh, this, uh, this meeting of the, uh, the Ledge Branch Capacity Working Group. We will have another event next month. I believe it's the 13th. Uh, so look out for that invitation. And uh, thank you all again so much. I uh, really, really appreciated this conversation. Thank you, James.